All right, everybody, thank you all for being here. We know it's a short week. Um, we'll get started here with Coach Huff. He'll open with a statement, then please raise your hand. I'll bring the mic around for questions. Um, how's everybody doing? Uh, appreciate you guys being here. Um, obviously, short week, so uh, got a lot to do, a little bit of time to do it. Um, excited about the opportunity we have coming up this week, coming off a tough battle last week with uh, Georgia State. Um, not the result we wanted, um, but a great learning opportunity for our program, our players, um, all involved. A lot of missed opportunities, a lot of self-inflicted um, missed opportunities that they capitalize on. Um, they made some plays, so hats off to them. Uh, like we talked before, extremely um, complimentary of what uh, Coach Elliott has done uh, with the Georgia State roster and team. Um, like I said earlier, probably one of the most improved teams um, in our conference that we've seen or played. Um, so hats off to them. Um, talk to the team afterwards um, about making sure that we don't fall in the trap of having competitive arrogance and assuming or preconceived notions of um, who is a good team or who isn't a good team or who we should beat or who we shouldn't beat um, by the logo on the side of their helmet. Um, we we got to make sure one of the things we talk about is having competitive humility, and that is the respect for winning and what it takes to win. Um, and regardless of the opponent, you prepare that way, you practice that way, you play that way. Um, and when you don't, any team in the country can beat you, regardless of what their logo or their history um, or what you perceive them to be um, says. I think a little bit um, where we are um, in college athletics, um, we all kind of say, okay, well, these teams you should beat, these teams you shouldn't beat. Um, that, that's competitive arrogance, and we don't want to dance down that road, um, especially in our program. Uh, we want to live in the fact that if we do what we need to do throughout the week in preparation, we play really hard, and we execute on Saturdays or Thursdays, uh, we can beat anybody in the country. Um, competitive arrogance would have told us that we would not have beaten Notre Dame. We should not have beaten Notre Dame. We shouldn't even play the game. Um, competitive arrogance would tell us we shouldn't have beat Virginia Tech or we should have beaten um, Albany. But I think, again, it goes back to how well do we prepare throughout the week, um, how hard do we play, and do we execute consistently. And if we make mistakes, Huntington High School or Cabell Midland is going to beat us. And I think – um, part of growing a program and building the culture that we have, um, the human nature tells us and our players, hey, this program is this or this program is that, and we got to get to the point to where we prepare with the same mentality uh, week in and week out. Um, so a really good learning opportunity, not saying that we overlook them or anything like that, but I think sometimes um, it's one of these deals where you should have won that game. No, we shouldn't have. We didn't execute well enough to win. Um, if we'd have executed better, we would have had an opportunity to win. Um, so that's the learning uh, for us. Um, a lot of the things that showed up uh, were things that you know we had been working on, trying to get better. Some of the things we had gotten better on, we just didn't get good enough. Um, and when you play competitive teams and you make mistakes or you don't take advantage of opportunities, um, you know, you end up on the wrong side of, of the scoreboard. So great learning opportunity. Really excited for this opportunity um, with JMU coming in. Uh, phenomenal program. A lot of respect for Coach Signetti, his staff, the players. Um, probably at our level, um, the benchmark for consistency right now, you know, and what they've done and been able to do um, in all three phases, uh, what they've done and been able to do in this conference, what they've done and been able to do this season. Um, so a lot of respect for them. Um, it's going to be a challenge. Um, their, their record and profile says that compared to what we've done um, and what we've been able to do. Um, I feel very confident that our guys have prepared well in this short week. When we looked at this um, kind of window in the offseason and how to prepare the organization for it, um, we knew this was going to be the, the toughest stretch we had based on the games, based on the bye week, based on just the typical um, ebbs and flows of the season. Uh, we knew that when we got to this point, we would be in a dogfight and we'd be in a heavyweight championship boxing match. And we've been cut. We've been hit. Um, we had to go back to the corner, but we haven't heard a bell. Um, so we're going to keep fighting. 
Uh, we get back up off the stool, go out there next round. The way you win a championship boxing match is one round at a time. You don't have to win them all. Um, ask Floyd Mayweather. You don't have to win every round. But what you got to be able to do is learn from each round. You get knocked down, get up, get back to the corner, get your cut man to clean you up, come back out, figure out what punches, what plays, what issues caused you to last round, um, and improve. Um, so Thursday night will be exciting. Looking forward to a great atmosphere and another opportunity for us um, as a community and a program to be on national television um, and show the world what the Marshall brand is all about. Um, I do not have an injury update, so in the words of Coach Saban, don't ask. Um, I don't have one just because of the time. You know, I can't tell you who's what. Um, we are just like every other team in the country, I would assume. I don't assume any team in the country is at 100%. Um, so managing our players and managing um, the reps this week and managing how we prepare this week is something we've been thinking about for a long time in our you know, preseason, how do we map this out. Um, so it's going to be a challenge. You know, I talked early in training camp about the ability or want or need to develop the back end of the roster. Um, these are the weeks that is important. Um, practice is different than games. You know, getting them in practice is great, but we haven't been able to get them in games in certain situations. Um, some of it's been forced. They've had to play. Um, some of those guys have stepped up to the challenge. Some of those guys have not. Um, some of the guys have just been inconsistent. That's what you get with a guy that hasn't played as much. I think uh, where we are in college football, you think transfer portal, you think, oh, Johnny comes from this school with this logo. Oh, he's a good player. Well, he probably hasn't played a ton. That's probably why he's transferring. Doesn't mean he's not a good player. Just the experience on the field um, is something that you just got to do. You got to get out there and play. Um, and I think a lot of our guys who have gotten opportunities have learned um, and will improve as the season goes on. So with that, open up with questions. You, you've been through these, you know, ups and downs as a head coach already here. Yeah, you know? it's kind of like my, my my track record, right? We <laughs> roll out early and then we get tripped up for a couple weeks and we roll out again. I don't know. Um, but, yeah, I have. Um, part of it, I think, is a little bit, um, you know, the ebbs and flows of a season. You know, last year at this time we were, we were talking about um, not having one of the best college football players, you know, on, on – in the in, in the world, in my opinion, uh, with Rasheen, you know, and that was not something that was planned. That was something that happened. Uh, we adjusted. You know, I think obviously the more good players you lose or the more good players you have to go without or you can only go a certain amount of time, obviously it puts a, puts a damper on it. Um, I think a little bit of competitive arrogance comes in. Um, we've been lucky enough as a program to win a lot of games, and sometimes um, the greatest – threat to success is success um, because sometimes you get blinded by the things you need to do or continue to do to be successful. Um, some of it is just you play good teams. They make plays. Um, I know a lot of our fans and a lot of our supporters think that we're really, really good. We are a good team working to be great. Um, and when you're good, you can't make some of the mistakes that you make when you play other good teams. So um, I told them at the locker room, uh, we, we've been in this situation before, um, not where we want to be, where we are. Um, I told the leaders, I said, if you think that life's going to give you anything without adversity, you're sadly mistaken. And I think that's what this football season, that's what our last couple of years has done. It's given us a lot, but we've also had a lot of adversity to get it, if that makes sense. Coach, when you, when you look back at the film and you see um, whether it's a penalty or, or the roughing the punter, is that a, is that a mental mistake? Is that, are they over-exuberant physically or is it just kind of – Well, really what it was – and well, what I think it was, because I don't know because I'm not in the minds of 18- to 22-year-olds. Um, really, what, what I told the guys on Sunday when we had our first meeting back, um, everyone is trying so hard to be great. That's really what it is. When you have those type of penalties where a guy jumps over the shield, we don't have a drill where we rep punt block where a guy jumps over the shield. We don't have that drill. So the reason we don't is because you can't control your body. But when you see those type of things and you see the penalties at the end of the game that come out of frustration, what it is is everyone's trying so hard to be great. And what I told them, we don't need you to be great. We need everybody to be good. And your individual good will be our collective great. 
But what happens is now I'm trying to play an A gap and a B gap because we can't stop the run. I'm trying to block a, a defensive end and a defensive tackle because I want Cam to be able to throw the ball. Well, now you are trying too hard. All we got to do is do your job. And, and I think sometimes when you have success, you have good players, you have kids that want to win, you have a mentality that's play hard, sometimes trying to be great can cause you not to be good. And I told him, I just need your good. Give me your individual good, and we will collectively be great. If everybody does good, there's no way we can't be great. And, and I think sometimes you start to press a little bit. Frustration sets in, right? These guys want to win. We're winners. We have a winning program. This is not something that, you know, Owen Porter came in and talked to me yesterday. He said, you know, I haven't given up 40 points on defense since I've been here. I said, yeah. I said, that's, that's frustration. That's life. I said, there's going to be a time in your life when you've never been fired. And your boss is going to walk in and say, hey, we're, we're laying people off. You're out of here. And you're going to have to deal with that. How you respond is more important than the, the incident that happened. So I think it's a little bit of everyone trying to do too much um, because everyone sees the need to do more. Everyone sees the need to you know, correct some things. Um, and then sometimes trying to do too much can cause more issues. Coach, kind of <clears throat> going off of that, you know, last week we talked about these big, you know, bursts, 50, 60 yards that were happening. We kind of saw that again on Saturday. Do you think it's also a discipline issue, same, same kind of issue? I think it's a combination. I think you got, we got some guys playing that are not used to playing. And when you're not used to playing, you're a step slow. Um, we didn't have as many missed tackles Saturday, but we still had some. Um, typically when a missed tackle occurs, it usually re results in an explosive play. Because that means the scheme has put somebody in position to make the play near or at the line of scrimmage. Well, when you have a missed tackle, we don't have a scheme that has you and you designed to stop the ball in this particular area. So now you're getting spread a little bit thin. I do think some of the um, Georgia State game plan was to kind of spread us out because we haven't been able to tackle well in space. That's good coaching. Um, we've got to get better at that. Some of that is personnel. Some of that is moving guys around. Some of that is changing some of what we do to eliminate those spaces. Um, but it's one of those things that when it shows up, you can't say, okay, we'll change the call because the call put a guy there. Um, what we've got to do is get that guy better or we've got to replace that guy, you know, in order for us to be able to still continue to have success. Coach, always the great coaching connections and uh, with you and uh, Kurt, uh, both of you had the opportunity to work under Coach Saban. I don't think you guys have ever worked together, but you have crossed we paths. We both made it off the hill, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah just, uh, could you just talk about, you know, your, you know, what you've seen from Kurt? Down yeah, I think, again, um, and, and I can't speak for Kurt, but I think anytime you work for the greatest football coach, you know, to ever live, in my, in my opinion, I, don't, I didn't know Newt Rockney and I don't know Vince Lombardi, but whenever you work for the greatest – Anything, you know, a person that's done something really well, you take a lot. Um, you take a lot from that. Um, and I think what you see in JMU's organization is a lot of similarity to what you learn under Coach Saban, consistency, discipline, um, playing team football, you know, playing all three phases. Um, obviously, there is a human element that comes in. You know, you got good players, you got young players, old players. Um, but I think when you see the consistency that they've had in their program from the time he's got there, you know, until now, you see some of those things. You see the discipline that they play with. You see the intensity that they play with. Um, you see how they play team football, complementary football, offense, defense, special teams. Um, there's not a lot of ebbs and flows, you know what I mean? There's a lot of consistent moments, you know. That doesn't mean that they score a touchdown every time on offense or three and out on defense. It just means over time you start to see consistency. Um, I think consistency in the staff, the guys that have been there a good while, you know, you think about – where we were in year one to where we were at year two, we kept 90% of our coaches, you know what I mean? So it was a little more consistent. Uh, when you have that turnover, then you have a little bit of a shake in the foundation. Not drastically, but you have some of that. Um, so I think, again, I'm assuming, like I said, I can't speak for him. Um, I know um, his family has been in coaching a long time, and I do know that the secret to success or sustained success um, is consistency and discipline, you know. So if he learned that from Coach Saban or his dad or his other family members, um, but what you see is that same consistency, discipline, do your job, um, playing team football, um, and over time it works. I think we have a great litmus test here. Over time, our organization, our process works. Um, you know, you look at our <clears> – <throat> time here we've been pretty consistent we've gotten better obviously every year you're going to have ebbs and flows right um, but over time sustained success is the goal 
Coach, they're going to be here in about 48 hours. Just what does the next, like, 48 hours look like for you guys? Yeah, for us, we're trying to maximize today. You know, today is kind of like a, a mix between a Wednesday practice and what a Thursday practice would be if it was game week. Um, we haven't really focused on them. We focused on us and what do we need to do to do our job extremely well. Um, and how can we minimize or negate the frustration of let's try and do more or let's try and do, you know, somebody else's job. Obviously managing, you know, the reps and the practice, you know, with just having a game less than, I don't know, I can't count past 72, but three days ago, how do you manage that? Because you still have to have a certain amount of reps. You still have to have a certain amount of time to practice and meet. Um, how do you manage guys going to class and getting rest and getting treatment for a quick turnaround? So our focus has been on us. Um, obviously, when we get to tomorrow, we'll make the flip and really start talking about uh, what we need to do, you know, specific to JMU. But it's been focused on us. Obviously, in practice, we're running you know, scout teams and those things. But it's been more, hey, did you do your job on that rep? Hey, did you go to class today? Did you go to treatment today? Did you get rest today? Um, did you hydrate today? Did you eat today? Like, that's been the main focus. Um, and we'll make the switch kind of tomorrow and start kind of mentally um, thinking and talking about what we need to do Thursday night. And you mentioned Rasheen. You know, he was responsible for all three touchdowns on Saturday. Is he having that kind of season that you expected from him? I think he's doing a really good job. I, I think, again, the, the people around him are, are really helping. I think Cam is playing phenomenal, and that creates a lot of opportunities for Rasheen and the receivers. I think the O-line is doing a good job. Uh, what we've got to do is we've got to minimize the, the false starts that put us in third and 15. Well, that, that changes the landscape. We've got to minimize the holding calls that back us up. We've got to minimize the turnovers. Um, you know, it's, it's not the negative runs or the runs where he only gets a yard that hurts you. It's the opportunities where we get a positive play or we get in a situation that's manageable, third and six, third and seven, and we get a false start or we get a holding call or we get a bad snap. Those are the things that we've got to adjust. Um, but I think Rasheen is doing a, a, a good job, you know, for what, what we're asking him to do. Um, I always think there's always room for improvement. But, you know, if you said, hey, this is where he was going to be, I don't know, what are we, five, six games into it? Um, I, I think he'd be pleased with it, with the understanding of he can continue to improve. Coach, you alluded to yesterday that the JMU's got a solid defense. What do they do that's going to really stress you? I think, again, they, they're, they're sound. You know what I mean? So they don't, you know, some teams that you play by week, they change and they come up with something a little different to kind of stop what you do, um, which gives you the opportunity to kind of do something else. Um, JMU does what they do. And because of that, they do it well. You know, I mean, they do their job very well because they don't try to scheme of the week or they don't try to adjust because, you know, you have a good running back or you have a good receiver. Um, they play sound. And what it allows them to do is it allows them to adjust everything out that they see because they know their system. You know, I mean, it's adjusting off of what's the install say or what does the system say when number two bangs out or number two's off the ball, um, which allows them to play with a lot more consistency, if that makes sense. If you try to do something just for this week, well, you know, you only get so many reps at it. Well, they've had a ton of reps and a ton of practice at doing and playing their system really well. Um, the other part, they have good players. <laughs> That's You got good players, all the plays work a lot better. Um, and they've got good players on every level. And that, that's where you can kind of separate the good teams from the extremely consistent teams is, you know, on the D-line, they've got multiple good players. You know, number 99, I've said it before, is probably one of the best D-linemen in group five. Um, they've got two, you know, defensive ends that are really good. Their backers are, are stout. And because of that, they have guys on the back end that are, that are in position to make plays. Um, so it's a combination, a combination of consistency and scheme um, and then having really good players. And on offense, uh, you anticipate uh, them being a little bit similar to what you've seen these last few weeks? or? Yeah, I think, again, um, you know, McLeod does a really good job in their system. I think he knows their system. So what happens is when he gets in games, if the picture changes defensively or if something happens, he knows right where to go to. Do I hand it off? Do I pull it? Do I go to the first read, second read, third read? Again, they're not trying to – they're going to run their system. They're not trying to say, okay, well, these plays work against this defense. And then you get in the game and they don't run that defense. They're saying our plays have answers versus whatever you do. Our quarterback, our running back, our O-line, our receivers, we just have to get to those answers. And because 
they keep that mentality, they can get to those answers quicker, if that makes sense. I think you start to see, um, you know, as the games go on, you know, McLeod gets a lot more comfortable. As the season goes on, he's gotten a lot more comfortable. Um, the system that they run is the same. You see the same plays every week, different formation, different alignment, or whatever it may be, different area of the field. Um, but they run the same system. You know, they, they're trying to do the same things to give him the comfort, to give the receivers the comfort, the running backs, and then obviously the O-line. Coach, uh, Coach Ignetti was real complimentary of how you guys played last year, but he did call this game a trap game. I don't know if that motivates your players or if they heard that or is yeah, there anything I, to that? Yeah, I don't, I don't know what that means. Um, but, again, as, like I said, he knows his team, so he knows what he needs to do to motivate his team or to remind his team or whatever it may be. Um, if he saw our injury report and came to practice, he may take the day off. I said yesterday he probably should take him to get ice cream or go see Barbie at the movies because they probably could use the extra days off. But, again, in his mind, he knows what he sees on film. He knows what his team is able to do. He knows where his team – every team is in a different area of the journey. You know, we're all in week whatever, but we're all in different areas of the journey. They've had different experiences. They've had different adversity. They've had different successes. Um, they've got different leadership. They've got a different culture. So he knows what they need to do. Um, Someone have to give me the definition of a trap game. Um, you know, to me, we don't look at it that way. We try to go one and know every week. That's where the competitive humility comes in for us. Um, but you are still dealing with 18 to 22-year-olds. So the stuff you guys write – the money lines, the fans, the Twitters, the ESPN projections, they read that stuff. So they read that, you know, X, Y, and Z school is, you know, on a two-game losing streak. They read that X, Y, and Z school is great on third down, a first down, a second. They, they read that. Um, so it affects, you know, sometimes their mentality in which they approach. And what we as coaches try to do is we try to negate that with consistency. You know, it doesn't matter how many games they've won or lost when they play you. you got to play them on Thursday night at 7 o'clock. Um, if the wins carried over, then Georgia and Alabama would never have to play anybody because it would just say they should win. Um, and I think that's what coaches in their own rights try to make sure that their players understand that there is a human element that we recognize, but ultimately we've got to go out and play really well. You know, six games in, um, when you look at the defense as a whole, you're sure there are the missed tackles and missed assignments, things like that. Um, but when you look at the defense as a whole, are you happy with the way the game's being called? And, and you Yeah, you know, we did, a, we did a study. We went back. The first three games, we were getting 15 points a game. So you talk the first three games, that's Albany. That's, um, what do we play second? ECU, and that's Virginia Tech. So you can't say the litmus is it's not void because you're playing whatever. So the first three games, we were up 15 points a game. The next three games, we're giving up 38 points a game. Well, so we looked at it. Well, what is it? We're calling the same defense. Okay, wait a minute. Game three, he's out. He's at 60%. Ooh, he was a little banged up. So now he played. Okay, well, he wasn't in his gap, or he was in his gap, or he was there week one, he was there, made the tackle. Week four, he was there, didn't make a tackle. So we were able to see the same thing you had, right, because I look at it from everything. Are we – or coaches, are we doing what we need to do to put these guys in position? Is the game plan tight enough? Are we calling the game the right way on both sides of the ball, um, all three phases? Yes, it's the same defense. What it is now is the ebbs and flows. You know, okay, well, this player makes the play. This player doesn't make the play. Same exact play, same exact run, same exact call. Okay, so what do we need to do? We got to get this player more reps, or we got to find somebody to replace this player, or – what we do in coaching, if we can't replace the guy, he can't make the play, now we have to change the call to try and help him make the play, whether that's blitz, tighten up, loosen up, whatever that may be. Um, you know, it's, it's, and it's, it's tough because there's some guys in those first three games that weren't making plays, and the second three games are making plays. One of the, one of the biggest guys, J.J. Roberts, remember me talking about him the first game of the year, the quarterback long run. He doesn't take the quarterback. Well, then he comes back in NC State and he's picking the ball off like he's Ed Reed. So what do you say to him? Do you say you suck the first game, but you're good to – you know what I mean? So it's the ebbs and flows. And I think, again, I think, again, it's the consistency. You know, J.J.'s played a lot of football. He hasn't played a lot of football here. Um, he played corner at Wake. He's playing safety here. Um, there's going to be times where one mistake can be catastrophic, and that's kind of been what's happened to us. Um, in the past, we have had mistakes. They just weren't catastrophic. So everybody was like, oh, man, the defense is great. Well, 
that same play is one play away from being catastrophic. Well, we just hit catastrophic in you know the, the situations that we've had, um, but we've also hit pay dirt. I mean, Josh Moten jumps a bubble that we rep seventy five times. I mean, we couldn't have rep that play more than anything. Jumps a bubble, scores a touchdown. At NC State. You know, I mean, so there are some areas where some guys are doing some really good things. I think Owen Porter has got. I mean, um, Austin has gotten a bunch more sacks because they know how good Owen is. So you could say, well, Owen Porter's not having a great year, but every time you look on film, there's two people blocking him. <laughs> so is Owen Porter not a good player anymore, or is he just the people know that, so now other people are benefiting? So, again, I think it's it's a combination, and you know, that's the ebbs and flows. The tough part is obviously you don't like to lose. you know. So when you lose, you know everything looks doom and gloom. But the sun is shining in my office. The sun is shining in the Shuey building. Um, we are in a position where we have had some success. We've had some learning opportunities, and we've got to build off of it. Thanks, guys. Look forward to seeing everybody Thursday night. should be a phenomenal um, atmosphere um, for everybody here in Huntington included, not just uh, the football fans. So thanks, guys. Go Herd.